got a lot of people in the states and stuff that are keeping bearded dragons in, in, in bioactive enclosures that look like they're at the bottom of the veggie garden um whereas yeah. Yeah, you know, I get an idea for enclosure and I think, okay, this is what I want to do. And then I look for an animal that's going to gonna suit. And then I see if I can, if there's a behavior of that animal that I think that I can bring out. You say you have that same sort of sense of uh, enjoyment. Yeah. So what about that species gives you that too? Um, just just the way it interacts with its habitat, you know, like it's, 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 it swims, it, it perches out on the branches, it's got crazy vision. Welcome to episode number 78 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com if you are looking for more information on the podcast or any other show or episode that we have recorded. Or if you want to pick yourself up an Animals at Home t-shirt, there is a link to the shop there. And of course, with the purchase of a shirt, $5 is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. As always, there are affiliate links in both the YouTube description as well as the show notes. So if you do make a purchase, a small commission will come back to me at no extra cost to you. Joining me on the podcast today is Tyson from the Instagram account Doc Merton. So you might be familiar with Tyson's Instagram account. I think at this point it has almost 40,000 followers. It was one of the very first Instagram accounts I followed with Animals at Home when I started this whole journey. So that was pretty cool. The account itself revolves around a Merton's water monitor named Doc. So we do talk about a bunch about Doc throughout the podcast. And Tyson has these unbelievable enclosures that he set up for her. And, and through the history of his Instagram account, those enclosures have evolved from those early stages to what he has now, which is an, sort of an eight foot enclosure with a six foot fish tank inside. It's really amazing. But he also has a bunch of other animals as well. And they're all set up in these beautiful enclosures with natural sort of universal rock backgrounds. And Tyson is just an incredible craftsman when it comes to enclosure design and construction. And he has a business to go along with that called Habitats at Home and he's recently started a fresh YouTube channel under that brand name as well. So in the podcast we talk about that, we talk about his history in enclosure building and how he got into that and then we discuss the importance of using the animal's natural history as a framework for enclosure design. So Tyson walks us through the process of how he does that and we also talk about bioactivity in the hobby and some of the issues that he sees with it and some of the solutions that he's working on. I really do hope you enjoy this episode and without anything further here's my conversation with Tyson. Tyson welcome Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. I've been a huge fan of your Instagram page for a very long time. I've been following it since I started this channel, and it's always amazing watching what you're doing. And now you're doing even crazier things. We have this massive enclosure behind you that we're going to get into and everything. But why don't we ri- rewind it back a little bit, and you can let us know or tell me how. <clears throat> tell me the first the story of the first reptile that you got. Okay, so the, fir- the story of the first reptile I got is not a very nice one, really. <laughs> um, so I would, I would have been about five, um, you know, madly in love with Ninja Turtles, like most five-year-olds of my generation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my mum, knowing that I had a love for, for reptiles and, and Ninja Turtles, she, she bought me a, a pair of two red-head sliders. And they didn't last very long. I can't even imagine what care sheet was given out with them. Um, you know, uh, 17, oh, 27 years ago um, in New Zealand, albeit. And, uh, yeah, they, they um, I kind of never really asked what really happened to them. I haven't really spoken to, to her too much about it because it doesn't really make me feel too good. <laughs> um, but, you know, mum's trying to make her kids happy and, and, and uh, yeah. But um, basically after that, um, when I was about nine, my mum got me a, a toy turtle for my birthday and she said, you know, you can keep this or if you would like – another pair of turtles we can go get you some and of course I said yes and uh, we were living in a small town a uh, small coastal town in New Zealand at the time called Monganui it's in the, the North Island the very top of the North Island and somehow she had found this English guy who was breeding turtles down the road from us um, and we went to his house and he was keeping all the adults in a, in a big greenhouse and he had a tank in his living room with a whole bunch of tiny little baby 20 cent size turtles and said pick two and um he gave us like a little plastic critter keeper and said you know put a rock in there get a desk lamp put a put a light in it and um change the water every couple of days and 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 go for gold and and that's what we did and they um they lived for about uh six seven years transferred between tanks and ponds and 
and, and all sorts. Um, and then we had one, um, we had them outside. We moved into a house that already had a, had a pond, but, um, you know, not knowing anything about ponds and not knowing, you know, we having really access to, to any information in the hobby back then. We, I just, there was fish in there. I thought, okay, this would be fine. I, I put them in and, and uh, they lived for a little while and one ran away and one, one died. And Were they sliders as well or? Yeah, yeah. So, so New Zealand's kind of a bit of a crazy place. Like, so obviously I, I'm Kiwi. I live in Australia now. I've been here 10 years, but um, I, I grew up in New Zealand. And, and reptiles in New Zealand is kind of an interesting uh, thing because – we have such like amazing. Uh, so there's only three three types of uh, reptiles in New Zealand. There's geckos, skinks, and tuataras, mm-hmm. um, na- natives uh, essentially. Um, and some of the geckos we have are the best in the world. Like they are they are sought after, highly highly prized all over the world. And most of the ones you see overseas are actually smuggled because we have such strict uh, laws in New Zealand. But a lot of what you, um, you you and you would think that because of how amazing they are, there would be a lot of people keeping them. But they're just not. At least, if there are nowadays, I don't, I don't know who they are. I don't, you know, so the reptile are. hobby in New Zealand in general is pretty small. It's pretty small. So, so, but it, it kind of it goes on. So we have exotics in New Zealand. Mm. Um, I think. So I'm going to try and list them. There's reddish sliders. They've been around for a long time. There's leopard geckos. There's Greek tortoises. There's blue tongue skinks. There's central bearded dragons, eastern water dragons. And I know, so, and this is where it gets a little crazy, is that there's a big underbelly for for sort of illegal reptiles in New Zealand. And I know of iguanas. I know there's ridge tails. I know there's green tree frogs. I know there's one, or there was one female Chinese water dragon in the country. And I imagine there would be some snakes there, but I've, 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 I've never seen them. And, and getting caught with a snake in New Zealand would be worse than getting caught with a kilo of cocaine, probably. Oh, my gosh. Because I guess, so, yeah, when you have an island with absolutely no snakes, like, you do not want yeah. to bring... Cause there's no there's... snakes in the zoos or anything. Really? Wow, that's crazy. Snake ban. Wow. Uh, and even the zoos, what they have in the zoos is pretty limited as well. So, um, yeah, and, like, it's the the Greek tortoises, for instance, are, like, very, very, very uncommon. Um, the... The iguanas were kind of a crazy thing. So it was like a, a lot of the animals were brought into New Zealand before the 60s um, on on like these permits. But then these permits got hidden in basements or, or, or wherever, you know, these permits were sort of disappeared. So the way it was working, and this is how a lot of better dragons and, and all, of, all the animals, that the exotics that we have were, were actually allowed to stay there, is essentially, essentially, well, it's okay. This is this is the this is the history how I remember it. This might not be ent- entirely true, but I'm going to give it to you the way it's, I, I know it. Sure. So you can imagine like people had these animals since the '60s, and they were you know someone's dad's brother had it in a basement, looking after it, you know, in a, in a glass tank for all these years and breeding them in, in secret. And then essentially more have been smuggled in to sort of improve those uh, genetics, um, and then they hunt around for these permits. So they basically got all these all these animals ready to go and then they hunt around for all these permits and then they essentially go, I've got these iguanas for sale, here's my permit. And then they just hope that uh, DOC um, is essentially the, the Department of Conservation or it's it's MAF, I think, actually, uh, Ministry of Agriculture and, and Fisheries, I believe. Um, they just hope that they say, oh, yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> so they and, sort of reverse and, engineer it, start with the animals and then get the permits yeah. after. Yeah, and they hope for the best. So that's what happened to the iguanas. Like they had iguanas for sale for like four grand on, on eBay. They saw like Trade Me, which is like our version of, of eBay. And then um, a bunch got prepaid and then they came through and then uh, uh, confiscated and culled them all. Um, wow. But I know they're still there. So like they're, they're still around. So it's quite like and I know that the, the, the person that had the ackies and the person that had the green tree frogs and, and all of that, that's what they try and do. So I'm, I'm a little – I'm very um, – uh, it's one of those things like I was not involved, but you know, you know, people and, right. um, and, uh, I always found it very, very interesting. Um, and, and but I, I'm so far removed from, from New Zealand reptile keeping nowadays. So in New Zealand, are the exotics still <clears throat> like, can you still own them legally if you have the permits? Like it's not like Australia where you technically can't, or is it all still yeah, kind so, of gray? Okay. So this is where it's crazy again, is that exotic stuff you don't need licenses for. Oh, so you can keep whatever you want. Um, and it's not like, it's more of like the import permit to say that the, the, the animal came into the country legally. It's not like you have to have a permit to, to keep the animal. Mm. Um, 
And I think that now what they've done, like I said, I'm, a bit, I'm quite removed, but essentially their grand, grandfather band, I think Blue Tongue Skinks, they grandfather band, um, oh, yeah, I think it might just be the Blue Tongue Skinks at the moment, but I know that they're making moves to, to, to stop a lot of the, the exotics um, over there. So it's sort of, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to say, but like, like Eastern Water Dragons, for instance, if you go to the zoo in Auckland, there's like a, like a little canal or river that runs through the middle and they're everywhere. So they've got out of what they've, they've, they've had there and they're, they're, like, they're everywhere there. Um, Interesting. But it's like literally like around the zoo in Auckland, there's a wild population of Eastern, like Australian Eastern Water Dragons. Wow. It's so kind of a, yeah, it's kind of a beautiful place. So how long have you been in Australia then? Just gone 10 years in September. Oh, okay. So when you moved to Australia, then I guess you were open to a whole different sort of herpetoculture. You were starting to be able to keep different species. So tell me about that experience. Yeah, so so um, when I moved here, I actually I moved to Australia with the with the goal of traveling the world. So I spent my my, my 20s traveling around, basically. Um, went on, like I just saved and saved and saved over summer, working very hard. And, um, and then I would leave for winter for, for sort of six months at a time. And in between, like if I was here for a, few, a, a little while, I kept a couple of things, but, you know, just sort of low key. And then, and then um, uh, my, my uh, girlfriend and I, we went on a, a big final trip for, for 13 months, uh, backpacking around. And then when I came back, I was like, okay, if I'm going to settle here, I need to like get back into it basically. So um, yeah, like I, I always built, so I built enclosures and, 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 and bred better dragons back in New Zealand. Mm. It was quite a funny story, really. Like, um, so I kept red sliders as a child, um, two two pairs, and um, I remember I was about eighteen or nineteen. I had started my electrical apprenticeship, and I was driving home from work, and there was like a there's like a big um, chain reptile, uh, sorry, chain pet store in New Zealand called Animates. I think it's called. I think it was called at the time. And I remember I was like, oh well, I'm driving home. I'll just I'll just pull in, I'm going to have a look. And I, and I, I walk through the door and I see this blue tongue skink in a glass tank. And I was like, mind blowing. I was like, I've never seen one of these in New Zealand. I didn't know you could, I think I'd seen one in the zoo, but I was like, I did not know you could keep one of these as a pets in New Zealand. Uh, I, I was just like, I was it's like, I couldn't compute that. I was what I was seeing. I was like, okay, I need this. I need, I need a blue tongue skink. And um, I think they're about 1200 bucks. Oh my and, God. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, we're talking four or 14. No. You know, I'm 32 now, so when I was 18 or whatever, <laughs> have a, have a long um, and and basically, I remember going home and, and getting on the internet, and I think, I think you know, we're like we're still kind of just coming out of dial-up days, you know, back then. So you know, yeah, we have the internet, but we don't have the access to the information like like we do today. Like it's hard to think that back then, like yeah, okay, we had internet, but that doesn't mean there was anything there to look at. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was like hunting around, like where do I get a blue tongue skink from? It's like obviously, you know, I thought if they've got them for twelve hundred bucks, someone's obviously got them for less. And then I discovered that you could get better dragons in New Zealand. And and isn't it crazy that when you kind of like don't know something exists, but you open that door and realize there's a whole world there that you just didn't even exactly. didn't even realize. It, you know, you know, like you've got a kid from New Zealand that's loved reptiles his whole life. Um, and, but never had access to them being in New Zealand. And then all of a sudden it's like, there's this whole new Pandora's whole new box. World. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it was for me. And um, so I'm like, right. Okay. I see that there's better dragons. I'm like, okay, better dragons are cooler than blue tongues. Um, don't kill me, but it's my opinion. Um, <laughs> and then I was like, all right. I hunted around, found a guy uh, sort of near me that, that, that bred them. And I went and see, went and saw him and I was like, can I have a bit of dragon? He's like, yep, 500 bucks. I was like, yep, sweet. And then um, like, well, how do I, how do I house this thing? And he's like, oh, you can do it like this, like this, like this. And I was like, okay, leave, like just hold on with this bit of dragon for a little bit. I'm going to go and research this. And I start looking online. Um, I start seeing people building their own enclosures. I start seeing people building their own rock wall. Um, and, and this is the days of like uh, tiles you know, everyone had oh, everything yeah. on tiles. It was Ceramic like, tile. Get a dragon on sand, it's going to die. Yeah. And I, I was like, okay, <laughs> no sand. Yeah. Um, and um, you can actually see, I, I made a post on Instagram um, recently, uh, and, and you can see some of the first enclosures I, I ever built. Like, there's one on I've there. I've seen it's it, like, yeah. Yeah, so um, 
uh, you know, red tile, red rock wall, fake plants. This is great. And I, I found that, that dresser on the side of the road. And I, I rang the guy who, um, Simeon, the guy's name was. Hey, bro, I'm going to, I want this bit of dragon, but I'm going to build this enclosure. He's like, oh, are you sure? You're going to like, you know, it's hard. And I was like, nah, I'm going to do this. And then, um, yeah, just bang this enclosure together, learn how to carve polystyrene and learn how to lay tiles. And obviously I was an electrician, so like an apprentice, so I did all the electrical work myself. And then I got this bit of dragon and, and, and then, yeah. I kind of went from there, really. So that's how. So that's how the enclosure building business kind of started. That was the infant days. Yeah, so you started with your day. own, and then did you start actually building enclosures for other yeah, people so right after the story, that? The, the story continues. So, so yeah. basically, this bit of dragon. Like I had such a bad run with reptiles when I was young. Um, the the bit of dragon, after about six months, it developed some sort of. I guess it was MBD. It, it it's it's back between its shoulders grew like uh, concave like a saddle. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and you know, I mean, I, it, it it had everything. So I don't know, I, I can't really explain it. But um, essentially, I got it put down in the end. We tried for months and months and months. It lived to, like around six months that we started seeing it, and it lived to well over a year old and um, nursing it. And eventually, the decision was made to put it down. And you can imagine, like I was, I was devastated. Like here's a kid, eighteen years old this whole world has just opened up and then I felt like the whole world had, had come crashing down around me. And, um, I rang Simeon and I said, Hey man, like, you know, this dragon's got a problem. He's like, look, don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll give you another one. And, um, so I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to take another one, then I need to build another enclosure. Like I need to, I need to get better at this. So I built a second one and you can see it in one of those pictures as well. I think it's like a it's similar sort of thing, but a bit, a bit smaller. So I started keeping that one. So that was my second enclosure. And then um, Simeon decided he was going to move to Australia. So he's like, look, I've got all my better dragons. I've got, he had a, a business called um, Exotic Pet Supplies. And uh, he used to like sell um, like heat emitters and, and UV tubes. You know, they were T8s back then. And, and, and he had a guy who was making glass tanks and stuff for him. And, and I was like, okay, well, look, if you're going to go, I'll take your better dragons. I, I bought the business off him. Um, and and then I basically started breeding bearded dragons and selling enclosures with the bearded dragons. So that's when I started making, um, so I, I started making melamine flat pack enclosures at about 20 years old or something. Wow. Um, yeah. And I've always, yeah, I just have ever since. And, and that was when I discovered, um, so the, the next part was that this guy, um, uh, his nickname was lizard, but he owned a, a Mexican restaurant in, in New Zealand. And he said, Look, I, I want to. I want a really amazing enclosure, and um, he wanted it to separate the restaurant from like the the bathrooms and the the entrance to the kitchen. And I've always had a fascination. Do you know um, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet? Is was that is that a movie? Was yeah, it? yeah. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I've you seen know it, when yeah. they meet. You know when they meet through the fish tank. Oh god, it's been so long since I've seen that okay, movie. I love okay, I love that I love that scene when they're like on, on, on either side of the fish tank. So like I've always been fascinated with room dividing tanks. Mm -hmm. And that's what I built. I was like, right, we're gonna have glass on both sides and we're gonna make the ends uh, rock panel. Mm -hmm. So um, I had hunted down a piece of universal rocks in New Zealand. Like I saw it, fell in love with it. I was like, I'm gonna use this. But then I needed a second piece. So I, I actually got a piece sent over. So my, my um, parents had moved to Australia but at this stage and um, I, I found a huge piece of Universal Rocks wall on eBay in Australia, bought it, got it sent to their house, gave them the dimensions that I needed. They cut that piece of the wall out, boxed it up, sent it to me. I installed it in this enclosure, gave it, gave it to this, this Mexican restaurant and this was the birth of Universal Rocks. And if you can see behind me there, that big piece that's there is cut from the same piece as that enclosure. Really? Yeah. Wow. So there's, there's like, now there's about 14 or so pieces in there. The background is made up of about seven. But that, that piece there I've had since, you know, I was 20. Well, and you use Universal Rock for basically everything you do at this point, it yeah. seems like. Yeah. What's really funny as well is that back then when I when I discovered Universal Rock, I was like, you know, young, bright-eyed, 19, 20-year-old. I sent them an email. Hey, I really like your product. Uh, please, can I, like, import it or use it? And, you know, like, and, uh, yeah, they didn't reply. <laughs> <laughs> Was this when they were still in Australia or were they already in Texas? Uh, 
they may have just or moved. wherever they I, are. I don't know. I, I, I've never really calculated that. But oh, okay, um, interesting. I think they, I think they had moved to Texas by then. But um, but yeah, like I, I used to, like I've done the whole make you know, make make rocks out of, of polystyrene and, and 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 stuff like that. Look, I never, I never got to the levels of like Matt Somerville and people like that in mm-hmm. terms of how good they can do it. But um, you know, I I, I, I can. Um, I just don't. Uh, once, once I found um, Universal Rocks, I, I just was like, "This is this is the product, and it works really well for what I like to do." And uh, yeah, and it's so durable too. Oh, it's unreal. Yeah, it's yeah, unreal. they make a great product. Yeah. So then, eventually, when you did move to Australia, I'm guessing you had to give up the the beardy breeding business. But did you you bring the cage building business to Australia no. with you? Oh, that all dropped. No, um, no. so I, I left the bearded dragons that I had with the with the restaurant. Um, and they, they lived on there for, for many years. Um, and then, look, by the time, moving here was kind of crazy. So, but we basically decided that we were going to move. And then six weeks later, we moved. And wow. I, I left all of the, the, the enclosures I had all sold, basically. But the, um, the products that I had, like the inventory I had, I essentially just uh, left in a storage unit. And it became... The, the bane of my existence for <laughs> about two years, you know, again, like I'm 20. So I, like on, on one hand, I'm like super entrepreneurial and, and really hungry to, to, to start a reptile business. And on the other hand, I'm, I'm wanting to party and go out and I'm in Australia and like life's amazing and I'm making more money than I ever have just by moving. And, and it was kind of like, I, I thought that I'd move and I would get all the stuff sold, but I just never did. And um, yeah, it kind of fizzled away and cost me a lot of money. Um, but yeah, I, that's I, how I we just, learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just just yeah. I I I make a lot of mistakes, um, but I make I make a point out of learning from them, you know. And and I think that's a really good. Um, it's helped me a lot. Like I'm really not afraid to fail. So. Well, that makes a big difference too. And so then, what what were some of the first animals that you got once you landed in Australia? Um, so I had, so in between traveling, I had a, a albino Darwin carpet python mm. and I had a ridge tail monitor. Okay. And now your current collection, obviously you've been, you haven't been traveling for a while. I'm sure you've kind of settled yeah, down a little bit. Yeah. So uh, tell me what's in your collection now. Cause you have a pretty decent collection and we're going to talk about it more because it's a, um, it, the, the setup you have is incredible, but as just, as far as just to give you people a rough picture, what do you keep right now? Okay. So I, I pick my collection quite carefully. I make sure that I stick within what I can manage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm actually at the pretty much at the limit of what I can manage currently right now. Um, so I have one Murden's water monitor, Doc. Um, I have one Ridgetail monitor, or, or Aki. Uh, I have two olive pythons. I have two green tree frogs. I have one common tree snake. I have four angle-headed dragons and one Maclay's river turtle. When you pick and your species, fish. yeah, and some fish. Yeah. When you pick your species, do you is there a certain area that you try to focus on that you like to keep from, or are you just kind of picking species that you gravitate towards? I, I should mention I've got at any time I've got three hundred plus yabbies as well. Can you tell everybody <laughs> what a yabby is? Because I feel like that's Australian yeah. slang. Yeah, uh, yabby is essentially a freshwater crayfish. Uh, right. the, the common species here is called Kerax destructor. Uh, in, in the States, you know them as crawfish or craw daddies or craw dads. And, yeah, so. and, and you have that many because you feed the Merton's monitor? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I keep, I, I have like a 600 liter tank, um, which is like, a hundred, I think it's a 180 gallons in silly numbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like a big uh, laundry tub. That I keep them in, I buy them three hundred at a time, and, um, and and just keep them alive and, and, and feed them off when necessary. I've got to go pick up um, this week. I've actually got the week off. I'm going to go pick up another three hundred or so. Are they easy to keep alive? Uh, yeah, clean water, lots of oxygen, hmm. um, and lots of surface area because they murder each other. Oh yes, yeah. I guess uh, they can't. Yeah. They're probably pretty aggressive. Yeah. Well, so this is the thing. So I, I've actually been breed, trying to breed them, and breeding them is actually very easy. Um, but raising them is the hard part. So mm-hmm. in order for them to grow, they need to shed. And when they shed, they, they get like a sort of paralysis and then they, then they just eat each other. So like they've got no hard, they've got no hard skin and they're, and they're sort of immobile and then one will come along and, and 
and just feed them. Uh, so, so can you tell me a little bit about your Instagram page? Because it sort of revolves around Doc and it's a pretty big page. So tell me about why you started it and then how it's kind of slowly grown over time. Uh, sure. So I uh, actually don't really like social media. <laughs> I really, I had actually completely gone off it. No Instagram, no Facebook, no, no nothing. And it was great. It was a simpler time. Um, but basically, when I got back and I, I was keeping, um, I was keeping Doc and I was making enclosures. My my girlfriend was like, you know, um, people probably want to see this. And I thought, okay, well, we will just start. We'll just start posting some videos of Doc, and I'll just keep it for my own sort of personal record. And then, you know, people started taking interest and. It's hard not to get motivated by by that, and and then uh, yeah, it started being quite fun, and it definitely motivated me to do do more and and, and get out there, and, and it just blew up like pretty quickly, and um, yeah, so that's that's that's, that's where, how we are we are at today. Well, it's I mean a, a big part of it is it's amazing. I know this is a second enclosure I think that you've had since you had the channel. Maybe it's the yeah. third. Oh, it's the third. third and those are all custom made by you, right? Yeah, everything. The only because thing I don't make is the rock wall itself mm -hmm. and the exteriors. Can you tell everybody a little bit about the current cage that Doc is in? Because it is huge and it has this massive aquarium and it's a, just an amazing looking enclosure. Uh, yeah, sure. So it's, um, it's 2.4 meters by 1.7 meters tall mm. by... 600 millimeters deep uh, basically and then now it actually has a, an extension you can see it there um it's a four by two by two uh extension that has um soil in it for her to dig um the tank is uh six by two by two um oh sorry the, so the enclosure is eight by two by six in feet yeah, there you go. That, that'll be good yeah. for all the American listeners. Most of the Ameri <laughs> most listeners are American, so it's good conversion yeah. for them. <laughs> we know how much they struggle with the numbers. That's right. <laughs> and then yes, yeah, so, and then a, a six foot fish tank in there, which is huge. Yes. And you have yeah, like I, I think some rainbow fish in there. Yeah, yeah. I've got the red salmon's and Bosmanis, and I've got some Chinese sucker fish in there. And uh, there's an eel tail catfish, Tendanus, Tendanus. And she doesn't bother the fish at all. No. Is, will, will Mertens not eat fish? Is that kind of or no, just no, the, they eat fish? They eat fish. So, so I, um, when when she was small, when she was in her original tank, I bought some. Uh, what are they? Barbs, like feeder barbs. Yeah. I bought like six of them and put them in there, and she gave a little chase for them, and then just never touched them, and I, and I had them for 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 ages, and um, yeah, she's just never been never been interested. Um, she will. So I have seen her eat one. Um, basically, I was feeding her on the water's edge and like a little bit of, uh, it was like I was feeding her like monitor, monitor mush or monitor mush or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And a little bit fell in the water and a fish came up to eat it and she just nabbed the fish. So, I mean, it wasn't really like any effort on her part. Um, but yeah, otherwise she's not really that active. When I actually shifted her up here and and filled the tank up, so... I put her in and she, but she, she was in there for a couple of weeks, but I had to wait for the tank to cycle properly before I brought the fish, uh, brought the fish up from where they were. And I made the mistake of not feeding her first. So when I put the fish in, she went bonkers and started chasing around. She never caught any. But the thing is, as long as there's yabbies in there, she is much more interested in, in the yabbies. So, so in the, in the, if look, anyone who wants to keep murders, I've, I've got this. So, and I, I send this to people. This is the, Ecology and Behaviour of Varanus Matenzi, um, and it's by Mr. Philip James Mays. It's a it's a scientific paper. It's huge. It's thick as hell. Wow. Uh, I go through and I've, I've, I've highlighted a bunch of stuff in there. Um, look, it's probably not, I wouldn't consider it the, the Bible, but it's a bloody good start. Yeah. Um, and and everything, everything I do is sort of based on my personal observation and, and what I've read in that book. I'd love to contact that guy and, and actually... Have a, have a chat to them but essentially in the wild um 70 of their diet is actually crabs it's not yabbies um where up where up where at least where this paper was is in the kimberley and there's a high abundance of um, little freshwater crabs now crabs yabbies same thing um but 70 is made up of crustaceans uh 15 is fish 
five percent is like eggs, reptile eggs, and then the other ten percent is made up of like insects, spiders, um, probably like ground nesting birds and and, and rodents and, and things like that. So it's so crustaceans is their main main thing, and then and then fish basically. So fish fish in terms of their whole diet is actually very small. Hmm. So do you mix around the diet quite often? Obviously, you use the the yabbies as a staple, and then do you throw some variety in as well? Yeah, everything. Uh, she gets everything. Mm-hmm. Every, everything that's possibly available, she gets it. And it uh, is really cool watching her go after the the crayfish yeah. because she's she hunts them and she chases them and gets crazy amount of exercise. It's like exactly what you want to see with that animal. Yeah, exactly. And and look, I get some. I get a lot of criticism over feeding the the yabbies um, uh, from a, a range of of, of, of things like some people say, oh, obviously I shouldn't feed her live, mm. um, you know, or shouldn't feed her meat at all. Um, you know, so that's, that's one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is that I should, I should, you know, I should kill the yabbies first, um, which doesn't make any sense. I should rip the claws off the yabbies first. So they want to make me the monster. Um, and then, uh, and, yeah, and look, it, literally everything in between. Um, she knows what she's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, she's, she's evolved for hundreds of thousands of years to, to eat yabbies. Um, you know, as a keeper, you obviously want to make sure your animal is safe. Um, and I've seen her take a claw to the eye on multiple times and she does not care. Wow. Like she literally does not care. She takes that claw, like that claw in her eye and she smashes it against the rock. <laughs> she, she does exactly it, like she's programmed to do. So, so I'm, I'm there like this, but, you know, wow. like, what, what, what are you going to do? You know, she's, she knows what she's doing. So is the, is the argument for not feeding live similar to, like, the snake argument that you shouldn't feed live because it's dangerous to the animal or it could be dangerous to the snake? Um, or Yeah, I think, look, I think, I think they're coming from, like, the, where, they're, where they're coming from is, is a good place. Like, they, they obviously care for, for, the, for the yabby as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, quite often, like, in this argument, people, people lose sight. Like, they want the life of the prey item that, negate the life of the predator it's yes like, yeah it's an uneven balance so it's like like nature is not pretty they can't um, both live in this scenario yeah they can't they can't both live exactly and um the thing the other thing is that like i, I won't feed her rodents live um i don't see it as sport like the amount of like how many of these feeding videos do you see where they chuck a rat in and then the rat yeah. just sits there not knowing what's going on only to get thrashed to shit by a giant monitor Exactly. There's, there's, no, there's no chase in that. Like, like I'm all for for nature. Like, I get it. I know it's what would happen in the wild, but I think we're like, and people want to claim it as enrichment. I don't see it. You can throw a dead one in there, and the same thing is going to happen. So totally. I like. I'm all for enrichment. Like, if you if you you know, I guess this is horrible. This is horrible, and I'm not saying I would do this. But the only way I can see it working is that you. Every day you need to scare that rat. So as it's in its tub, you need to make that rat terrified. So it knows that it's food. And then on the day that you feed it, you, you scare the hell out of it and you chuck it in there. So its adrenaline's on high and it's looking around and it's looking at what's coming for it so that when this monitor comes after it, it runs. Right. That's in rhythm. But that's horrible. Exactly, I yeah. I not suggest doing that. Like, yeah. like that's, hor- that's a horrific thing to do. But once you've done that, then I can see it as enrichment. And I the yabby, the yeah. yabby is a prey item. It knows. It knows it's in trouble as soon as it's getting in there. Like I'm, I'm not doing anything to that, that yabby. Like they run from each other. Right. So as soon as you put it in there, it's it's on high alert, and there, there's chase immediately. Yeah. You know, and she goes but right after. That, it. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, you know, it's controlled. She's in a tank. You know, but there's yabbies in there now. She doesn't get them all. You know. And, and the yabbies are what eat the fish, by the way. So if I, like, lose fish, it's because of yabbies, not because of her. Interesting. Yeah. So, so like, how many will you throw in at yeah. once? Will you throw in, like, a, a bunch for a week or so? Or how does that? How do you feed her? No, I, so I give, her, I give her two to three every three days hmm. or so. Um, and I make sure, I essentially make sure she gets one. So I know she's got food in her stomach. And then the other two I chuck in there. And if she gets them or doesn't get them, that's her own fault. And she eventually will go after them when she's hungry and ready. Yeah. yeah. I keep her, like, I, I want to see her hunting every day. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. That's the enrichment I don't, factor. I don't baby her, you know. I, she has to work for everything that she gets. Yeah, which makes total sense. And I also know that you have this, like, universal rock ramp that's just behind your yeah. shoulder. And I've seen you put this on Instagram as well, so I encourage anybody to go check it out. So tell me about that ramp. 
So the ramp started because someone criticized me for her jumping out of the tank. Oh, was she jumping down from yep. the top? She used to, she used to <laughs> jump out and someone said, you're horrible, you're going to hurt your lizard. And I went, okay. And then the next day I built a ramp. And then so, they actually said, they actually said, oh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, good on you for fixing the problem like immediately. And I went, hey, like I'm, yeah, <laughs> like, I'm yeah. not trying to hurt. It's exactly. not like I was asking her to jump out. You know, she just does it. So, so how does the ramp work? You can slide the glass open and then she can just kind of walk her way down when she wants or how often do you let her do yeah. that? Yeah, so the ramp's actually on like a, it's like a, so there's a door that hides the filter and then the ramp is onto another panel and it's got like some cabinet stays. So the ramp comes out like this. Mm. Um, she doesn't really need it to, but it's just an extra little feature. And yeah, I just open the door and she just comes out when she wants. The, the issue I have here in this new reptile room is it's a carpet and, mm. and the she luckily for me she doesn't usually use the water as a as a toilet but she always goes when she comes out so i know what's going to happen so if she every time she comes out i'm there with paper towel and i'm i'm looking for that tail cock so that i can just sweep it under there and, and I, I i spent a fortune on this giant plastic rug to put in front of it but she'll still she'll come to the end of the rug <laughs> turn face off the rug and, and, and it looks like it's just it's just she a knows what she's ending. doing it's a never-ending ending <laughs> battle so you know, if you want to like, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to build. I'm finding it hard to build a relationship with her when like I constantly have to like, you really need to let them do what they want. Um, but I can't, <laughs> I can't just let her do what she wants. Yeah, um, exactly. There's gotta be some, the, some rules in, in the game. Yeah. You know, and once, once she's out and once she, I know she's gone to the toilet, she, she can go wherever she wants. I don't, I don't I, she's, she's got free roam, but until, until she's been to the bathroom, She's she's under under watch. So she she doesn't really pee or poop in the in the fish tank. No. That's a huge bonus. because that, that would be kind yeah. of a nightmare to clean. Look, it's really not that bad. So she only goes to the toilet every three days or something. Mm -hmm. And if I see it, I just I just like uh, siphon the actual solids out. Um, the, the eel tail catfish she actually breaks it up a lot. The eel tail catfish has a field day when she. When she when she goes, so she breaks it all up, and then it just gets sucked up in the in the filter. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, oh, I was just gonna—I think there was one more question I had about her enclosure. Just just on the tank, just on the tank infiltration, like like before, you know, like I haven't done anything new per se by keeping one in a tank, but at the time there was a lot of like people saying, "Oh, the waste, like she's gonna just mess that water up," and 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 it's like, yeah, okay, but you 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 understand that. Most people are keeping Merlins in a plastic tub mm -hmm. that they can barely submerge themselves in. They go to the toilet and then they swish it around because that's all they can do and they just swim in circles and it turns into a soup and then they go, oh, yeah, they mess up the water. I mean, it's, it's not really rocket science, you know, yeah. like, it, and you see some of these monster fish tank people, like fish tanks, some people keep like If you've ever owned a Pleco, those things are shit machines. <laughs> yeah. uh, Non-stop every day. You know, yeah. and 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 then you want to say, oh, she she's, you know, it's like a this is she she this is less than a low stocked monster fish tank. It's, yeah, it's really, that's so true. And yeah, exactly, the volume of water absorbs it. Yeah, you know. So, well, and one thing that I think is really cool because I think you're you're fairly new in the current room that you're in, and I just love the way you have your room set up. You did a room tour on YouTube, and it seems very thoughtful. Like you have. And I think you're you're still in the middle of doing um, a few different, you know, s setting it up. But you have like piping and everything running around the the back. Like one of my dreams one day would be to have a reptile room that everything is connected in a way where I could yeah. like connect water dishes and and have maybe all the water bowls are running on the same filtration system where you can. I don't know if if that's ever possible, but you have some things interconnected. I know you also talked about doing air lines to water bowls, so maybe you could talk about some of that plumbing and and water line or air lines yeah yeah so that's kind of my goal for this room as well i have a i have two pvc pipes that run well, most of the perimeter they will run all of the perimeter eventually um i've taken a page out of the aquarium book mm -hmm. um, a lot of aquarium keepers or um, aquarium hobbyists have like main airlines that run a loop around their their room um so the air compressor that's outside that pumps air into that pvc pipe and then anywhere i want air i can just drill into that pvc pipe and put a tap and then and then it, it, it goes to a tank. So the idea is that eventually all water bowls will be, it will have air in them just to keep that water just a little bit fresher. 
and the other thing is a drain. So the drain I've been playing with because um, while I'm not really an aquarium sort of person, I, I like I like aquatic elements in my in my reptile enclosures. So right now I've got the common tree snake has a small pond. Obviously my turtle has a is, a, is aquatic and and in his dock. And I'm I'm planning on a few more aquatic things in future. And it it it's ninety five percent there. It's it's it works. It actually it actually works pretty well. Um, it's just getting the siphon started at each point that I'm, I'm still working on. And also the bioactives. So the bioactives, uh, they have drains drilled in the back of them. So when the misting system goes off or, or um, you know, you, you spray and it fills up, that water just drains straight out. So it automatically goes into those pipes and then it goes outside yeah, or whatever. it goes out into the garden. So it, look, I'm trying to make it work in a rental um, and it, it needs a little bit more fall. Uh, but the, the idea was to to uh prove the concept yeah and and i have so i'm i'm, I'm happy with it and when, and when the time comes when i buy a house and 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 we make a, a proper reptile room um we're going to get real crazy yeah and I, that's exactly the way i feel like there are so many people in the aquarium hobby that set up these amazing rooms where everything is connected you have like a control center at the at the beginning of the room or in like a closet and everything is running through that system and it seems like with the reptile world everything's always like slapped together and you're just trying to it, it would just it would be so much cooler if we could have a system that everything is connected and you can reduce maintenance like even like you're saying like even having the water bowls aerated is probably mm -hmm. incredibly beneficial like pretty much all water in the reptile hobby is stagnant because you change the yeah, water well. but like in three hours it's basically stagnant water and you might not change it for a day or two two more days so there are so many different ways that we can have, I think, a system of control that would make rooms so much more effective. Yeah, absolutely. It's not it's not very hard to do either. Mm -hmm. um, but I just had to make sure that I, I got it going before I moved a lot of the tanks and stuff in place. Yeah. Uh, and there's a learning curve too. Like I'm, a, I'm an electrician, not a plumber. Um, so... But being an electrician is a huge benefit for sure, because oh, I, I, that's one of the areas that if you're not like if you don't know anything about electricity, like most of us, it's just like so mysterious and you just don't know what you're doing. Yeah, well, hundred percent. And and also like you know I've been in the electrical industry for uh, 15, 16 years, and and I've seen you know I go to work and I watch other trades do what they do. Right. You know, so I, I build cabinets, but I'm I'm self-taught. You know, like I I know my way all around around all the tools and. You know, like the, the only thing that's really left on my horizon is, is welding. It's like the last skill that I, you know, eludes me, evades me at the moment. I've got to learn how to weld. Once I yeah. learn how to weld, the enclosures get a lot bigger. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Then you have way more structure you can work with. Yeah. And you have something in your room that uh, you, you mentioned in your video that every reptile keeper should have. And I actually just bought one of these myself, and that's a Dyson vacuum. Yeah. And yes, it, man. We just bought one of these, my wife and I, I think maybe like a month ago. It was ridiculously expensive, but at the same time, like the first time we used it, we're like, oh my God, this is totally yeah. worth it. Those things are insane. Yeah. Vacuuming is one of those things where it's like, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite zen. I go quite zen when I vacuum. <laughs> yeah. But if the vacuum doesn't suck man you want to just throw it through a wall exactly like yeah nothing makes or breaks your day like a vacuum there exactly <laughs> it is crazy how much that thing sucks up like the first time we used it we we're like how was our carpet this dirty like we've yeah. been vacuuming every, like you know once a week forever with this old vacuum but this yeah. this dyson just sucked up everything it's the convenience as well because like i get like a like turbo it just kicks dirt everywhere and i'm just like ah well when it comes time to do the vacuuming i'll get the giant vacuum out and i'm gonna I'm going to clean it, you know, and if, but if the Dyson is just like, bang, done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Over. So good. So I know your misting system, you have like this giant reservoir in, yep. in outside. So are you filling that with RO water or distilled water or, or is that just no, sort of water? No, just from your tap water and I just treat it. Oh, you just um, treat it? Yeah. So, so I'm working on something at the moment. Um, I don't know if you, if you know, like this, this common tree snake enclosure has been, has been sort of in progress for, for a long time. A uh, long time, and I don't want to give too much away. I was going to ask you about this because you kind of yeah. alluded to it. But you don't have to say yeah. more than you're comfortable with, but I'm definitely curious about what you're doing. Yeah, look, look, um, it's it's. I'm working on something like I love the bioactive. Like I love bioactive. Like I think it's the future. Um, I think eventually we will work bioactive out for for everything, no matter how big it is. Yeah. Um, but I think that you know, I'm no expert. I'm just going pure observation 
and you know like a lot of what's going on in the bioactive like realm doesn't pass the eye test for me mm. so um you've got a lot of people in the states and stuff that are keeping bearded dragons in, in in bioactive enclosures that look like they're at the bottom of the veggie garden um whereas yeah. here you know um they're very much red sand and 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 they get about as arboreal as climbing a fence post so I, I just, I, I also think that the amount of water and light required to grow plants is detrimental to the actual animal that you're, that you're keeping in there. Mm. Um, you know, I look at my angle headed dragon enclosure and I have to pump that thing full of light to get the plants to grow, but they are a shade species, you know, they're, right. they're not higher than 2.5 meters in the tree. So they're under a canopy at all times. And right now they're being bombarded with light. So I look at it and I just think this, it's not, it's not right. Mm -hmm. um, and these misting systems, um, like I, I, I was having a lot of, so when I got into bioactive, I, I built the angle headed dragon enclosure and filled it with plants and had it for like six months or something without ever putting an animal in it. And I want to say that to people, like if you're, so many people are like, oh, I'm going to build this. It's like people want to build their own enclosures and that's great. Like, please do that. That's the best thing you can do for your hobby, like for the future of your own hobby is to learn how to build enclosures. Yeah. But a lot of people like bang this enclosure together and then they're so excited before it's even dried yet, they bang their animal in it. Yes. And and I just like, I don't think that's that's right. You know, like, look, I, look, I do that too, but I've built enough now that I know that it's going to be okay. I'm saying if it's your first one, maybe you should be a little bit more, you know, err on the side of, of caution and, and don't hesitate from building an enclosure and then just not putting anything in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like test it out first. If you got, if you want to try some bright new idea, why not just do it in the enclosure and not have some animal be the guinea pig? Until exactly. Until you know it's going to work, you know? So that, when I, when I did bioactive, I thought, okay, I'm going to get into this, but I, I, I'm not a green thumb. I don't know how to keep plants alive. Um, I do now, but at the time, I just said, okay, well, I'm going to see what I can keep alive. And, and, and the answer was nothing. <laughs> yeah. <started>. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, and I was finding that I had to, my, my lifestyle, I was struggling to water that thing manually uh, every day. So I bought a, you know, the biggest thing you could buy and I set it up and I thought, right, this is going to solve all my problems. And I had it misting a couple of times a day and my plants were still dying. And I was thinking, well, what's, what's happening here? And I was checking all the roots and all the roots were bone dry. So the amount of water you actually have to pump that thing with so it hits the leaves and trickles mm. down and actually soaks the roots is, is insane. Because it, it's very much an aerosol coming out of the Mist King, yeah. right? So you're sort of just yeah. puffing it into the air and to actually water the roots, yeah. you have to leave and, that thing on for a long time. Exactly. And you're just soaking every or the animal and, and everything that's in there. And, and you know, the, the, you can have things, you can have like a moist environment as long as that animal can get dry. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest problem is the size of our enclosures. We've got to try and make all these little micro habitats, an area where it gets high humidity, but an area where it can also get, um, you know, completely dry. And, and this is, right. this is where, this is where a lot of what I see of what's going on just doesn't pass the, the eye test for me. Like it seems that we're so set on achieving this bioactivity goal to hell with the actual, like we think we're doing right by the animal, but yes. I, I think we're doing right by fitting into our Facebook groups that, that ban you for, for saying, Hey, you know, is this right? It's like, no, we're bioactive. You have to do it this way. If you scrub your wood, even if you're putting in a bioactive, you're banned. And, <laughs> and I just, I just look at that stuff and I just think, man, I guess so like, it's like the bio, it's a bioactive cult. Yes. And, and I just think that they're, they're wrong. Like a, Sorry, yeah, I, just, I, I, just I totally wrong. agree. Like people do get sucked into thinking that because they're using the term bioactive, that their care is automatically better when you could have a t giant laundry list of issues with your husbandry, but just because you have seven isopods rolling around yeah. through the dirt, you think that your bearded dragon's in great condition when yeah, they exactly. might be really missing the mark. And the other thing I see is like, oh, yeah, well, my, my, I'm not, I've got fake plants, but my, my soil is bioactive. It's like, well, newsflash, yeah. um, <laughs> you actually need live plants in the soil to actually create that, the full cycle because even those isopods are creating waste. That's and right. It's really tiny waste, but it's still waste, you know, so you actually need the plants to, to recycle those nutrients and, and, and then and put it back into the soil. So a bioactive system is not complete unless it has live plants. Yeah, I totally agree.
and so, that's not what the pages will tell you. Um, and so back to what I was saying is that yeah. I'm working on a way. I'm working on a way of, you know, I'm going to have. I'm going to say I'm going to improve the misping system, um, essentially, so that you your your plants are being watered at the roots, um, so the plants will stay alive without saturating everything. Huh. That is really interesting. So you can you can essentially water it as much as you like, but your animal is going to remain dry. Interesting, and that and actually helps with the I've humidity like as well. Like, yeah. oh, so, so you have a test run. So I was just saying like that helps with the humidity as well because you're actually yeah. saturating the soil. The soil is getting wet, and then but you're 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 totally right that when you soak the entire enclosure, the humidity does spike, but it evaporates and dries so quickly. The actual humidity drops again right away, but yeah. you can actually have a dry upper canopy if the soil is nice and wet it's still going to be relatively humid without making the animal sit in a cold wet corner of the enclosure yeah exactly so right now you have a test that's actually working yeah it works it works i just need to um buy a few more things Um, interesting so yeah it it works it's it's proven i just need to get there so and the other thing is that so part of what was going on with it is that uh the system that I had in behind the wall, it's all, it's all hidden behind the wall. It, 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 it popped essentially and it was leaking. Mm. Um, and so I had to rip part of the wall apart and, and, and rebuild it. And then I actually popped it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it was almost there. And there's, there's a couple, there's another little, another little, uh, issue going on in there, but it's, it's not nothing to do with that, but we're almost there. Oh, that's very I'm cool. actually, I'm actually like, I'm sick of these exoterra enclosures. They're horrible. Yeah, that's, I was going to ask you about that as well. So I, I just want to say one more thing about the misting thing, and then I want to ask you about the exoterra because obviously misting is still important for many species because lots of geckos and even some snakes will drink off the droplets off the leaves. But it's you're so right that if you could figure out a way to to water the soil and then you could actually mist less, maybe mist only yeah. twice a day rather than having to mist like for 20 minutes a day to get the... Anyway, that's an awesome idea, so I can't wait to see more of that. Um, I know that you had said on your latest video your first you know real tour video that you're getting rid of your glass enclosures so tell me about what you are using right now as far as exoterra and what you hate about them and then what you're changing them to um so i have the two 90 by ni- uh, 90 by 60 by 90s yeah. the commentary take and the angle heads and look I, I i move around a lot this the main the main thing is i move around a lot i don't own this house and i'm gonna have to move again once i'm hoping that the next time we move we we buy but um they just they just crack. They're too heavy, um, you know. And and I think that I don't know. Like I was like, okay, I'm gonna buy the biggest enclosure I can. That's that's like glass, and I just don't think they're big enough. Mm, yeah. Like we, you know, people are like, oh well, this is I'm gonna put my animal in this, and it's the biggest size, so it's the best one. I uh, don't I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm looking at them now, and I just think ah, oh, they're not. They could be bigger, and and extraterrestrial, but don't make a bigger one. Um, there's a company here. Uh, URS, they make a larger, similar sort of style, but they've got their their own, um, you know, people obviously like them or, or don't like them. But uh, my my goal now is that everything I have is on wheels. Mm. So if everything in this room can be moved um, and I'm going to shift them to larger enclosures that are on wheels. Are you going to build those enclosures or? Of course. Mm. So what will you use to, because right now if you're using melamine, those are, you know, some higher humidity enclosures. Is, is that an issue or how are you sealing these enclosures to make sure you're not getting okay, warped? So I, I've just, so part of the reason why I've been a little bit inactive lately is that I've completely re- retooled my workshop and, and I'm actually going to start using PVC. Oh, okay. So P, but PVC in Australia has been uh, kind of, it's been here, but it's been a little inaccessible just in terms of, of cost. Um, but now it's, it's finally come down. Um, and I've just been spending the last two weeks uh, cutting it, drilling it, screwing it, sticking it, just learning it. Um, but you know, I, I actually, I actually um, want to push back against this melamine thing uh, because that enclosure is melamine, and yeah. it's got no. So I don't know if you know this, but melamine is waterproof because the the lining on top of it is the lining. Yeah. It's only when you cut it that you have an issue. So right. it's not it's not the it's not the material that's the problem. It's it's the it's the application, and when I actually had so so you can look you know if you came here you could look over that entire enclosure and I don't think you would see one thing of swell and that thing's what, two and a half three years old now or something yeah um, even obviously top, like very humid are, yeah and where the vents are at the top it's just cut 
Like it's just cut at the top and an event and there's no swelling. But when I had to, when I built that one and I had to keep Doc in a, in a temporary enclosure for a couple of weeks, um, I, had a, I had a water tub, you know, like a plastic water container. And filling that water tub up, drops of water we call splashing was going in the, in the track, like the, gla- uh, the plastic track at the front. Yep. And within a few days it swelled. So it's not, it's, it's really, and like, and also like, while I had that aquarium, so the second iteration of Doc's enclosure was aquarium sort of sitting just inside. Yeah. And yeah. I had no issues with that either. So it's not, it's, 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 it's application. It's not the material itself. Melamine is waterproof. So as long as you're sealing it and not any, any sort of, um, any sort of, uh, uh, exposed chipboard is not getting soaked in water. It's fine. It's, I, I find it really funny. Like plumber, like well, not plumbers, but cabinet builders have been making bathroom cabinets and kitchen cabinets <laughs> at melamine for a billion years, and yet the so reptile true. community comes along and says, "Oh, it's a terrible product." I, yeah. I don't. It's it's not the product. Yeah, that's so true. It's just if you put a raw edge inside an area that's going to get splashed on, you're going to get swell. Yeah. But there's no well, surprise if pick, there. If you pick edging, it's like if you get low quality edging. Right. Well, I mean, nice. these enclosures behind me are, are formally like shelving units and they are totally melamine and I've been using them for six years or whatever, or five years. And yeah, I've had no issues. It's just, they, they've been totally yeah, fine. No. And sometimes people will comment like, this is stupid. You shouldn't use that. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I, I spray them down that I, I don't, haven't had any issues. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, I wouldn't suggest for a rainbow boa maybe. Yeah, or yeah, even I a wouldn't green either. python, you know, like that's just common sense. But for an olive python or a bearded dragon or you know, most of the arid species or most python species, there's, there's, there's not a problem with it. And, and look, I mean, look, maybe my position is a little different. Like I have all the materials and, and the ability to, to go out in my garage and build another enclosure within a few hours. So if I have a problem, I can fix it. And I get that, you know, you're, you're, if you're going to the pet shop and you're seeing a melamine enclosure for a couple of hundred dollars, then... You want to make sure you're buying the right product, and 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 that's fine. And don't get me wrong, PVC like already PVC is so much better. Oh yeah, light and like totally water resistant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I'm just saying like it's there's nothing wrong with melamine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like don't 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 shy away from it. Like don't go don't go if you're building your own. Like don't necessarily have to shell out for a, a PVC for a bearded dragon when melamine is going to do just fine. You know, courses for courses. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even in uh, in England and the UK, they use melamine enclosures all the time. And yeah. I think it's just uh, in, in the West, like in North America, we don't and we frown upon it for some reason, for basically no reason at all. So uh, there was something I was going to say, but I forget. I'll come back to it because I, I will remember. I always ask everybody who, who's in Australia, and I was just asking Cooper this as well, if, if you could keep an animal that is technically illegal, what would it be? Mm, interesting. So, you know, coming from New Zealand to Australia, I'm already in a candy shop when it comes to, to animals. Right. Um, I don't know. I I like a lot of the, like, the Asian keelback species. Mm. Um, I like, I don't know. It's not something I really think about. You guys have such a good selection. It's not really yeah, that big of a deal. I like like the, the the red-eyed crocodile skinks and and things like that. I like that you you have a lot more semi-aquatic reptiles. Well, the world has right. a lot more semi-aquatic yeah. reptiles than 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 Australia, and, and that's really what draws draws me in. Um, so like you know what you were asking me before is my my selection process, like how I choose mm. the animals I have. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I barge through with my yabby story. Um, so I love all reptiles. Um, but I pick reptiles based on what I think I can build good enclosures for. Mm. So I, I'll, 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 I get an idea for an enclosure and I think, okay, this is what I want to do. And then I look for an animal that's going to, going to suit. And then I see if I can, if there's a behavior of that animal that I think that I can bring out. So that's, that's how my selection process goes. Um, now, you know, we have a licensing system here in, in, in New South Wales where, you know, you can't necessarily just go out and get what you want. Um, so we keep a lot of species here. Like, like it's kind of, sh- it's, it's a really shitty thing to say, but you're kind of forced to keep an animal that you don't want in order to keep an animal that you, you do want. Because you have to go um, through that first two-year process. Yeah, yeah. through that two-year process. Um, 
so um, like you know I, I, I only have I can't go out and get any dragon species that I want I can't go out and get any turtles so sort of snakes and monitors I can get whatever I want because I have the, the correct licenses um, so like I got the angle headed dragons because I knew they could be kept bioactive and I wanted to get bioactive and I also wanted to get a dragon species on my license um, so and, and the only other real, the only other dragon species I'd like to keep are, are the um, voids. Yeah, uh, they're also quite similar to the to the angle heads in, in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, like it's, it's like like frilled lizards. I love frilled lizards, but for me, like I think that you need a massive enclosure and and an enclosure that's like essentially sand and leaves on the bottom and and upright trees. It's this 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 doesn't excite me. Yeah, you know, so I just like at least like at least I come up with some idea that I think okay, this is going to be really cool. Uh, I'm probably not going to go down that path. So. Well, I think it's such an important way to pick an animal, and that's something that I think we do terribly in the reptile hobby. We're just like, oh, I like the way that animal looks, so I'm just going to buy it. And then you get disappointed when you find out that it's nocturnal and you're never going to see it, and you don't even yeah. like the way that its natural environment looks, so you don't even want to build it a nice enclosure. That's like, find a part of the world that you want to recreate and then look for an animal that has behaviors that you'd like to see and then go find you know an animal that fits that bill. You kind of have to work at it that way. You don't want to start with the animal or else you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. I, I look for animals like, like uh, so I like building enclosures. I'm never going to stop. Um, even since when I was building enclosures when I was a kid, every every year and a half I would build a new enclosure just because I had a new idea. So uh, there's, there's two animals that I have that are like, uh, like a muse, I, I would say. And Doc is one. And um, Sonnet, the commentary snake, is another. I, I can see myself building enclosures for them for the rest of my life. Like there is just an endless, endless possibilities for what you could you can do for them. And the only reason why Doc doesn't have a bigger enclosure now is that like when I moved to this house, I was really hoping that um, I could get a bigger enclosure. Like so, Doc's enclosure is on wheels. It weighs probably 200 and 300 kilos or something when it's empty, yeah. and about almost a ton when it's full. Um, but I can get it through a doorway. Like it's two foot wide because our doors are two foot wide. If I, I was hoping that I would have, I've got a ranch slider at the back here, but in order to get to the back of my house, I can only go through a two foot doorway. Oh. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, yeah. it's like, it would be huge. Like, you know, it would be huge. And I look, I get a, a lot of like, people say comment, you know, I, it's too small. And, and also like, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's great that you're giving this animal so much space. And I, I actually err on the side of it's too small. I, I agree. Um, hence the, the digging extension, but it's, it's still too small. Um, and once we can, like this, this, the, the enclosure that docks in is going to be huge. It's, I've already got it. It's already planned. I, I know where all the pieces are. Like I've got all the pieces to do it. I just Will it be a very similar setup, just kind of expanded as far as dimensions go? Or do you have something yeah, crazier yeah. planned? Way bigger, way better. How big? You really? I've got it all. I've got it all. It's it's all it's all ready to go. I just need I just need a doorway that's wider than two foot. <laughs> so that will really? come when the, when a new house comes. House, when the house is bought, built, we're going to remove walls to put this thing in. How how big are you going to go with it? Uh, so the tank that I'm looking at is ten foot by four foot by three foot. Wow! Just to give you an idea. That's amazing. That's so, the tank, like the water part. Just water. Just water. Wow, that would be amazing. But yeah, like I said, it's everything sourced already. I just need the space. So one of the things that that book says is that is that they they basically tracked Murdens um, along the Kimberley. They tracked, I think, I think 20, 20 specimens or something, you know, something like that. And they basically found that they would travel a kilometer in a day, uh, up to a kilometer along the river, searching for food. They would hunt basically in the morning, like dawn and 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 dusk. And I see dusk. I don't really see dawn because I'm I'm never here. But at dusk, she is in the water having a last little little sniff around to see what's there. And they also f say that they, they never really found more than five meters away from the water's edge. So that tells me that the perfect murderer's enclosure there's one kilometer long, uh, and then what's a river? So it's say fifteen meters. Uh, no. One kilometer wide, fifteen meters long, and then say six foot high, or whatever. Oh, twenty meters, because you've got to have five meters of land. So five right, meters right, of land, right. fifteen meters wide of water, and one kilometer long. That's a perfect minimum. 
that's a perfect word uh, moon is a water monitor enclosure so you, know, you need a big house for that <laughs> yeah so we're gonna we're gonna try and do a little slice of that yeah, that's amazing. So I, I totally get the appeal of doing the Mertens enclosure because you have all these different features. But then you said with Sonic, your common tree snake, yeah. which is not a species I'm super familiar with, you say you have that same sort of sense of uh, enjoyment. Yeah. So what about that species gives you that too? Um, just just the way it interacts with its habitat, you know, like it's 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 it swims, it it perches out on the branches, it's got crazy vision. Um, like it's, it's ability to see what's going on on the other side of the room is, is insane. Um, you know, the, the, the idea, this is the, this is the other thing too, is that like, if you, if my, my process with enclosures is I'll, I'll read like the Wikipedia on it and you, you can get so much information just from a, a simple paragraph. Like for the, for a Merton's water monitor, it's, 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 if you get, uh, look at Wiki, it says something like often seen on branches over rivers ready to escape when someone comes you know so exactly what she's doing now you know yeah. Yeah. nailed it you know like that's that's it's, it's that simple yeah it's it's that simple you know like that's that's the whole the whole enclosure was designed around that one sentence and look there she is that's that's where she is so you know the common tree snake you gotta think it spends its life in the trees um and you know it's, it's well it doesn't actually it's so versatile it's so versatile. You find it everywhere, but you often find them near water. So there's water. Um, it, you know, I imagine that a common tree snake, they're quite, quite secretive. They're quite, you know, they move around. They don't make a lot of noise. I figured that if they're in the tree and they're in a bus, they're going to be coming out on a, on a tree limb and catching that little bit of sun just on the edge of the leaves and, the, and you know, so they don't get picked off by birds. So the way that closure is designed is that all the basking takes place out at the very extremities of the of that branch that goes through but then they also need all that space to hide so you've got plants and leaves and super dense planting on the one side and that's where all the water is and then out on this branch in front of the rock wall that's completely dry that's amazing. I love that yeah. detail. And it's it's something that I say all the time is that when you replicate those parts, that, that piece of nature that that animal's genetically predisposed to, to, to use in, in their, you know, in their habitat, they automatically do those behaviors. And if yeah. you set it up properly, it's like, boom. So will you see that snake bask in that way that you were kind yeah. of thinking that it would? Yeah. Them swim, bask, mm. everything. That's so cool. Like it's like, this is the thing, like the, the thing I get the most enjoyment from is that I read this paragraph, I get this vision of what the enclosure is going to do, and then I see them do it. That's like the best validation, you know, I, you can get. And, and when I see her doing that, the first time I saw her doing that, I, I, I was like, awesome. This yeah. is the best thing. Ever. And I, I come in here and, and Sonic's, you know, basking on the rock or, or out on the branch. And then he goes, ah, I don't, I don't like being it so out in the open, goes into the, into the trees, peers out at me and goes, ah, oh, you're all right. And then comes back down. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's so it's, cool. It's great. Um, well, and I, I do really think that whole process is something that we lack a lot in the hobby. And, you know, some, you know, we, we see this plague of very industrialized, boring rack style keeping and everything. And, you know, p people who keep that way really defend it hard but I always think like if they were just exposed to that process that you just talked about where you go through the research and you get this idea where it's like a spark of excitement and then you create it in the enclosure and then you get to see the animal do that thing, that excitement will just destroy any excitement that you would ever get, you know, with tubs. And yeah, that would make sure. that keeper addicted to that. The, the tub argument is quite strange to me. It's like, I, I, okay, I get it. I have tubs. Um, I don't really use them, but I have them. Um, I think they're good for quarantine. Um, I keep them around so that when I clean like the olive enclosures and stuff, like if I take them out, they, they're in the couch, they're, they're knocking everything over. Like, yeah. so I, I put them in a tub and, 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 and put them away and, and, you know, so tub, tubs were a new thing for me when I first started keeping, keeping the olives. Um, the, the, the albino Darwins I had, I, I kept an enclosure, but I was like, okay, I'm going to try this tub thing. Heat, heat, heat cable, um, big, big tub, like the biggest sort of tub you can buy off the shelf here. That's what I picked. Um, I put them in there and then I was just like, like, okay, well, you're not getting any light. You're not getting any UV. Um, you're not really even getting a day and night cycle like at all. Yeah. So, and, and you're barely getting heat. Like you've got this big snake on this tiny little thing. So it's like, just because you like measure the heat cable is 32 degrees, like whatever that is in 
Fahrenheit, a billion degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> um, then you know you measure the snake and it's still cold. So I just I just like how can you how can you say okay I'm ticking all the boxes like at all? Yeah. You know I just I just doesn't it doesn't compute for me and and I get the argument okay my snake feels more comfortable in a tub. Oh, okay, fine. So your your snake likes dark enclosed spaces. So why don't you just put a dark enclosed space inside of a larger enclosure so when you're around it feels safe but when you're gone it can move around exactly yeah like no i totally agree and like i it think just i think if yeah. people were more exposed to that process of you know of holistically caring for it they would realize the fun and the excitement of doing all that and the tub yeah, stuff cool. would start to fade away and, and look, I get I get clip clacks, I get the clip clack containers for hatchlings and stuff like that. Um, that's totally understandable. Um, but then you know, people, I, I really don't like this idea of starter enclosures either. Like like oh, I've got this this brand new snake. I'm gonna not, I'm gonna keep it in like a two foot enclosure, and then I'm gonna get a four foot enclosure, and then I'm gonna get a six foot enclosure. Like if you've been around in the hobby long enough, you you have to understand how to break line of sight. Like the, the snake needs to feel comfortable by not being seen. Yeah. And as long as like, you know, and, and yeah, look, a large area for lizards and stuff, it makes sense because they, especially if you're making them hunt for their food, but no one snakes hunting for food. It doesn't need to find food, you know, you know yeah. water, sure. But you, you can, you can have a large enclosure and, and put everything close together and that's going to work it out. Do you know what yeah. I mean? like it doesn't make really make a lot of sense to me. And, and, and it's just, there was something recently where someone it was a story and someone posted like hashtag goals on a, on a rack system. Someone had, I don't know who it was. And I, I thought about sort of blowing them up at the time. And then I, you know, you, have, you know how many times you write something out and then you go, yeah, ah, whatever. Yeah. No, it's not worth my time. Yeah. But it basically was like a, someone had spent a fortune on this amazing room. It was like vinyl floor, white walls, floor to ceiling racks, but they were all like gray racks or gray tubs gray racks and the first vision i got was um of a prison you know yes. like when you've got like all the, the levels of the prison and then you've got yeah. the balconies and then the rails and everything's gray and i just thought goals this is your goal it's like a filing system yeah like yeah like, <laughs> yeah this is I your think goal I, I think i've seen that i think i've seen that picture recently because i think it must you, have you know been what I, mean? like, I don't know who image, that was but right to my head it, this looks like a prison it's the same color it's like the same horizontal lines same I know, I exactly. just, I, look, I don't, I don't get it. I understand that you want to try and fit as many animals in a, in your room as possible. And you, and you get all these videos, they're like, oh my God, look at this pastel clown, hit pied, uh, whatever, ball python. It's amazing. Look at its colors. Look at its this and that. And then they just bang it in a drawer, slam <laughs> shut, turn the <laughs> yeah. light off and leave the room. Like, okay. Exactly. Wow, what a what an amazing animal to have in a drawer. Well, and I always imagine like the reaction of a non reptile person walking in. So you could say like we have this vinyl room with these rack, everything looks clean and crisp, and then you can have your room where your room looks like the section of a of a zoo, like a reptile zoo. So I mean, it doesn't. It's never gonna look like a showroom in here. It just never will. It's just not. Oh like my god, it it does. Like <laughs> look at this thing behind you. I mean, people will agree oh, with me. Thanks. They won't agree. Yeah, but what <laughs> they you won't can't agree with see you. is. What you can't see is the bit that's been chewed out of it over here that needs to be replaced, you know? Like, it's just, I constantly, constantly playing with it. But it's just that experience of being able to walk into a room like that is so, so much more impactful. It's like, there's going to be questions. There's going to be, wow, let's look at, like, I mean, just like we're talking, Doc is basking on this branch. Like, that opens up an opportunity to talk about the, the native yeah. habitats and how they act in the wild. So, I think it's pretty much a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the other thing I wanted to say is, like, about the tubs is that, like, like I said, I have tubs and I kept, I keep young snakes in tubs. Like I get it. They serve a purpose. And we also look at people who keep, <clears throat> there's even like, you know, these pet tuber YouTube people and they, they've got these giant collections of animals that they barely know how to take care of essentially. Yeah. Um, and, and they've got, you know, bearded dragons on paper towel and, and things like that or leopard geckos on paper towels. And I try not to be too quick to, to bash them, but there's a, there's a, period of time okay there's a like we, we think of a bearded dragon as a, as a basic animal and it is anything but they have so many requirements uv uh, vitamins correct lighting day night cycle uh, uh temperature gradient um things to dig into things to climb 
yeah. you know, like things to, to interact with, correct food. Like there's a lot to, lot to do. So if you have this better dragon and, and you, you just want to, you know, and it's young, put it on paper towel, 100%. Like yeah. that's good because you want to see when it passes its species. Like you want to see, you want to see it. You want to see how often it's doing it. You want to see that it's urate. You want to, you want to know that it's actually eating something and, and that when it's eating, it's not getting sand in its mouth. And you want to put like a basic branch or, 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 or something in there. Um, and that's fine. Like I'm totally for that. But now the like, ultimate goal should be loose substrate, uh, naturalistic enclosure and, and, and enrichment. That should be your, your, your ultimate goal. So I'm not too quick to like, while you're learning the animal, like it, you're learning it, it's learning you basics fine. It's yeah. not going to harm it, but the end goal should be something, a, a slice, a, a slice of the, the wild. I, I think. I totally agree. I think, yeah, just the mentality of, of knowing that you need to progress past that initial enclosure is really all you need. And it might take you a couple of years to slowly build up your competence and, you know, increase the enclosure, yeah. but you definitely don't want to st start with the paper towel and then stop there. Yeah. And I've, I've seen with these YouTubers, it's like they've got a couple of hundred thousand followers and, you know, they've got several animals. Like, look, if, you're, if, you've, got a, if you've got 40 plus animals, I would assume you know something. You know, you might have got them really quickly, but you're going to learn a lot of lessons really quick with, with 40 plus animals. And I'd like to think some of them, you know, some of the lessons actually are learned. Um, but if you're looking around your room and you're thinking, oh, I've got all these animals and we're all on paper towel and you're considering getting a new animal so you can make some new video, maybe, maybe look at converting them all to correct substrate slowly, you know, like, yeah. because now we're entering the, 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 the rat argument again where it's like i've got so many animals i keep them on paper towel because it's easier exactly so like it's easier for you but your animal lives a shitty life so yeah I, i'm not into it man. Like, so, so let's talk a little bit about your youtube channel because i i totally agree like everything you're saying is exactly what i've been saying for a long time and youtube has it's unfortunately the popular people on youtube have typically rough collections we can call it. there's some great people out there as well but there's a lot of really bad ones so you have started youtube just recently is that something yes. you've been thinking about doing for a while or, or tell me about that process yeah i'll be thinking about doing it for a while but but you know not having the time and, and i still don't really have the time uh now to be honest but um you know i think i have something to offer and and i'm still learning like it's hard it's hard to sort of um uh put yourself out there and, and, and the community is such as that if you get something wrong, you, you just get dragged through the coals, you know, like you've got to be yeah. perfect every time. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty big mountain to sort of climb when it comes to putting your first um, video out. But, you know, I'm trying. I've got another one that should be getting uploaded this, this weekend and um, about, about this, making the substrate in, in, in Dot's enclosure. And I guess it's hard as well because you've got to think, um, you know, like what, what might be sick in nature for me it might be something super basic for somebody like, you know, someone who's just getting started really wants to see. So I'm thinking exactly. like, I'm thinking like, you know, my doc substrate video is me mixing dirt. You wouldn't yeah. think that that's really that, really that uh, complicated, but you know, you're People doing see that a hundred percent. And even, you know, I'm trying to tell myself, okay, so I'm, I'm doing this so that someone who's brand new can, 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 can understand. So yeah, look, I'm, 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 I'm getting there. I'm also starting a business. So, so habitats at home, um, is my enclosure building business um, and Habitats at Home is the YouTube channel. Um, I'm not ready to uh, actually, you know, Habitats at Home, the enclosure building business is not quite ready yet, um, but it goes hand in hand with, with Habitats at Home. And, and the goal is to essentially build the best uh, reptile enclosures the world has ever seen and, and to help you do it at home as well. So are you building, I know you're building cages all the time, but are you building any for customers right now or, or you're just kind of waiting to get all your ducks in a row and then you're going to go full force? So, so yeah, like the thing I, the thing I'm, the thing is, is that like I'm building so many of my own enclosures that I don't have time to build any for anybody else. Um, I also work full time. You know, I'm a, I'm a site manager for, a, for an electrical company. I work 10 hours a day and I also, where I live now, I commute three and a half hours a day you know so my, my time oh, really is, oh my gosh yeah it's about an hour and a half in the morning and, and two hours in, in the evening depending on, on traffic but oh my um, gosh yeah like things things in my life need to change <laughs> some things got better and some other things got, got worse but you know it's, it's about for the next year or so but um you know the, the thing is is that there's a lot of people out there that are building boxes you know there's a lot of people out there building melamine enclosures or pvc enclosures and 
and they're doing it really, really well. And that's that's great. And I, I'm not interested in competing with those people. You know, like if um, I, if you want something really special, um, something unique, then then call Habitats at home. So yeah, and I think I think pairing that with the YouTube channel is really clever. And I think that's going to be a I mean, because you'll be you'll, you could probably have a, a decent income stream even from YouTube as well if you're walking people through the process and building yeah. cages, and plus your collection is just so amazing to look at, and I know you're constantly making changes in there. So I see very good things for for this channel. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. And just going back to like like my goal is to show a lot of like the basics of of, of enclosure construction because there's a lot of people out there, um, you know, it's it's kind of like second nature for me, like I said. But you know, there's a lot of people making these amazing enclosures, but they they they, they put vents on the back wall and it's like, well, okay, great. Now, how do you put a background in? Or, or they, right. they have to see, yeah, they put vents on the sides and then it's like, they have them up the top and then they put all their enclosures next to each other. It's like, well, what, what, what's, what's happened to your ventilation? There's just so many, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. many silly things where people see it on YouTube and think this is the way I do it. But then when they actually put it in their room, it, it no longer, no longer works, you know, and, and, and vents in the side, it's like, Okay, you put one up here and, and one down here, but air doesn't move side to side. It moves up and down. Right. So, so unless you've got like a, a cross breeze in your room, like what are you ventilating? The vents you aren't know? doing anything. And, you, and yeah. you've got to have fans. And then, and then it's like now you're getting real crazy because now you're trying to push air through each enclosure, which dries it out. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of ways of doing things very efficiently. And, and, and it's not as difficult as you would think. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to further content from you. And even I recommend everybody go check out even your first video is awesome. And like I said, you're one of the first people I've seen that has like a, a whole, a, say a bigger picture vision for the reptile room, especially when you're adding all these different components. And, and that is something that for sure I want to do one day. And I, I really hope other people want to do that too, because I think it, it gives so much more potential for welfare of the animal too, for keeping water fresh and constantly, you know, airflow is happening. And so I'm looking forward to, to seeing how you develop over time. And I think, uh, is there anything else that we, we haven't chatted about that you wanted to mention before we wrap up? We've covered a um, lot today. Not really. I just, I guess I just want to put out to people like, just, just, just do more. Mm -hmm. Look around your room and, and, and do more. Yeah. Just, you know, just get it. Like I, I, I have a couch in here. I come down here and I just sit and I just look and I, I pick every single one of my enclosures apart. Yeah. yeah that That's sucks. That doesn't work properly. You know, that glass needs to be cleaned and, you know, and sure, like, you know, I guess that can cause a lot of stress, but that's, that's what I like. I like, I like, I like, you know, like I'm trying to, not trying to sound up myself, but I'm trying to be, trying to be like the tip of the spear. You know, I'm trying to, if there's a problem, I'm trying to fix it. Yeah. Right? And I, I think I, as I'm building my enclosures and I encounter issues and I think, well, somebody else must encounter this issue as well. Like if they're on the same path as me somewhere in the world, they must be encountering this same issue. And I just want to try and, and, and work it out so that the time that you get there on your reptile journey, the problem's fixed. And there's a YouTube video that you can you can search up and it's going to show you how to do it. So I'm putting myself, uh, hopefully not my animals, but myself and my enclosures on the line to try and work this stuff out for yeah. you. Um, I'm, look, I'm YouTube, I'm trying. I, it's going to be slow. But I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, 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 I'll get there, and, and soon we'll start seeing enclosures for sale and, and, and things like that. But, um, yeah, the only other thing is that you know, follow me on Instagram, Doc Merton, Doc Dot Merton, um, Habitats at Home on on Instagram as well. Uh, there's not much ha happening there, but there will be soon. Um, Habitats at Home on on YouTube. Um, there's two videos up right now, and there'll be another one um, coming up shortly. And I really hope so. I, I do a lot of other stuff too. So I, I scuba dive. Um, I'm, I'm not very good at herping. Like if I see a lot of stuff while scuba diving, I'm like reptile repellent when it comes to, to actually going out in the bush and finding snakes and stuff. But I hope to be doing a lot more of that sort of stuff and, and, and obviously the enclosure building and, and a lot more of what's just going on in my room. Like I'm in here every day. So uh, the, the idea is that I'm going to start filming what I do in here and, and then showing you. So um, come along for the ride. It should be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, Tyson, thank you so much. We covered so much ground today and I totally love your philosophy and I'm, I'm happy to help spread that message. And I'm really looking forward to what you're doing in the future. So thank you so much. This was an absolute pleasure. Hey, thank you very much, man. It's been very enjoyable and uh, thanks to everybody out there listening. 
Okay, that is the end of that episode. Tyson, thank you so much for spending the time with me. I really enjoyed our chat and we actually chatted for probably another 30 or 40 minutes after the podcast. So I had a great time chatting with him. I'm sure we will do something again in the future. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope I give you some ideas for how to wrap your mind around enclosure design. Even if you don't want to go ahead and build your own enclosure, you can still use these concepts of using natural history as a framework to go about your enclosure design. And I think that is crucially important. Like Tyson said, find a behavior you want to to replicate and figure out a way that you can have features in the enclosure that will allow the animal to exhibit those behaviors. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, I would really appreciate if you could share it either on Facebook or Instagram. I really do appreciate that. I will make sure I reach out to you afterwards and thank you. And as always, if you're looking for more information on the podcast, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will find show notes for this episode, as well as links to all of Tyson's social media accounts. That's the Instagram for Doc Merton, as well as the YouTube channel for Habitats at Home. And thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. There are affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. So if you want to go check them out, if you need any new equipment, definitely go to that source. And of course, if you do make a purchase, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. That is it for this week, guys. Thank you so much as always for tuning in and I will catch you next week.